Uh, welcome, Suzanne Snyder. Welcome. So, Thank welcome. you. Thank you so much. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about oral history, the oral history summer school. Mm-hmm. How did you get involved in, in, in this world in the first place? Um, I really entered into the field of oral history through narrative nonfiction. But I would say that as a writer, oral history really answered a lot of the questions I had about the ethics of interviewing. Um, before studying writing, I had been a dancer for many years, and oral history really lives at the intersection of these embodiment practices and some of the things I was exploring through writing. So as we interview in oral history, we really talk about not just finding out information or extracting stories, but really it's a relational practice where two people sit together and that involves um, not just content, but really your physical presence. So it was kind of a perfect marriage for me of the things that interested me about being in a room with people. So oral history is really a long form interview practice, meaning it's a patient interview practice. It's not that 10 to 15 minute interview. And it includes, it's unproduced, undoctored, unedited. So it includes those ums and uhs that maybe you'd edit out later if you're making an audio doc or a podcast. Mm -hmm. So anything that's made from an oral history is important. It's just not the oral history itself. And the idea of the oral history is that it's this contract with the person you're interviewing that there's one version of that conversation where they had the final say instead of the interviewer editing it. But then mm-hmm. lots of beautiful things are made from those oral histories. Okay. So uh, from what you mentioned, th- there's a phrase that's on the uh, on the website uh, a fair amount, which is ethical interview practice. Mm-hmm. And it seems like that's what you were referring. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by ethical interview practice? Right. That's a a big claim. All of us might think our interviews are ethical. Um, Oral history is lucky to have a set of codified practices that are evaluated and reevaluated by an oral history association. And a lot of my colleagues in radio are left to just try and be good people, even though journalism has a set of best practices as well. But some of the things I would point to as concrete examples um, of ways oral history has guided me ethically is that we have a really formal agreement around ownership. We have a methodology that asks our interviewee to lead in terms of things like language, self-identification, and even disclosure. So rather than ask a hard-hitting question where someone must answer exactly what I want to know, I offer an invitation. I offer an invitation, which might sound vague to a trained journalist, but I'm not, I'm I'm still really going for something quite specific, but I'm letting the interviewee get there. Can you give me an example? Sure. Um, If I, for example, I mean, this is one of the hardest things. I get a lot of journalists and documentary filmmakers in my classrooms because I teach um, in a program for adults working at large, not just a grad program. So one of the things that I'm really training people in those contexts to do is to look at the implicit bias in a question like, how did you like school as a child? or tell me about your mother. Um, We might wanna know those things, but we actually think about the fact that not everyone can answer those questions. And so we might wanna start a little further back, widen the aperture until our interviewee mentions school or our interviewee mentions um, their mother. So I might start and ask about learning, even if I wanna know about someone's schooling. And if I want to know how they feel about the death penalty, I might start further back and ask about what is fair and not fair, ask about justice instead of that direct question. But I like to say oral history is really inefficient, but not a minute is wasted. Within five minutes, there's a different kind of relationship and trust. What is the main goal? Um, So if you've never heard this term, what what is the main goal of oral history? 
I think there are a lot of ways to answer that. But if you're asking me why someone would use an oral history approach to interview, I would say because it's ethical and productive. And what I mean by that in terms of productive, it's amazing at yielding long form narrative with anecdotal detail and also disarming people in the sense of offering those rehearsed stories that we dine out on. Oral history is really good at interrupting people's sound bites, essentially, because of the way our questions, the architecture of our questions. So so who are your typical students then? Are they mostly journalists or are they coming from other fields that I'm not thinking about? Yeah. So we run a school um, and one part of the school is workshops anywhere from two hours to 12 days. And in the room, it's a very interdisciplinary group of adults. And most commonly, we have radio folks. Um, we have medical students who want to do more ethical intakes. We have artists, journalists, documentary filmmakers, social workers. Um, so there's a really beautiful conversation happening about how all of these people use inquiry and interviewing. Um, and I've also run more focused workshops for journalists who are reporting on trauma and violence. Um, or, you know, a short workshop for the radio lab team. So we love going into existing spaces and calling in groups um, from all different fields. I guess there's no typical student, but okay, a lot of journalists. What do the students get out of going to the summer camp? Um, I think some of the things I've heard people talk about the lasting impact of a totally different way to ask a question and how much that's changed their lives um, in the ways they expected, but also in their day to day conversations with friends and family. If you want to change the conversations you're having with people who are very familiar to you, um, asking questions a different way and also using silence. Silence is really a superpower that people usually worry about wasting time, but actually silence can save a lot of time. Like I can tell in this form, we're going back and forth and I'm supposed to be somewhat concise, but in an oral history, you're intentionally letting someone know, I have time. I know you're used to giving the short answer. When they finish that short answer, you do not continue. There might be seven seconds of silence and they usually start again. So you just sort of wait and then you just ask this, you basically ask the same question again. You wait you... and see if they want to offer anything else. And often with that silence, a couple of things happen. They add to their story. They change their mind about what they just said, or they hear themselves. It's very common in an oral history to hear an interviewee say about their own story. I've never thought of that before. And then, you know, you're doing your job. When do you know? you're listening to a good interviewer rather than just, you know, somebody asking some questions. Hmm. An interviewer, I think, has to be humble in the sense that we ask some questions if we're doing our job that might not be very literary, clever, and might even not be grammatically correct. Sometimes my best questions are, questions that as a writer, I'm horrified by, but something like, what about everyone else? And my job is to help people move in space and time. Like, what about before? What about after? How about everyone else? Like, I'm kind of like a lever, helping them move and not get stuck. And I think that means laying down your ego. So I like those interviewers who aren't always showing off. They're letting the interviewee be the main player. Um, they are the ones who are doing the work. I'm ceding the space to my interviewee. Um, I do like, I, I'm not going to name really a podcast I love, but I am really taken with a format like On Being where they offer the edited, the podcast, and then you have total access to the raw interview. Yeah. And you can see how Bessel van der Kolk's you know, interview went, and then you can see what the show made of it. And that's a very oral history value, that there's some archive that really is evidence of what happened originally. Okay. Uh, you have um, 
done some work with sound installations. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that could mean a, you know, a few different things. So first off, can you talk a little bit about that and then maybe talk about the impacts, even if it's negative impact of sound design with, uh, vocal audio. I come to this as an artist too. And I like thinking about this work as an artist instead of a scholar. And I um, built in collaboration with the Oral History Summer School team, a roving sound installation made up of 100 participants and 25 cars, where we collaborated with our public radio station and um, worked with six interviews. Um, I'm trying to think of the easiest way to explain this. Six interviews that were really testimony by people who contributed their oral histories and then they died. And we honored those people who died by playing excerpts of those interviews while driving around Hudson, New York, past those places that they really contributed to and worked. And so we called this Automotive Archive, and it was a roving sound installation that we considered really a series of participatory obituaries and eulogies. And I'm really interested in social experiences of interviews, even though it's fun to listen on your headphones. Um, I really like listening together. And that's what sound installation can offer. Okay. So that is definitely a a very particular thing and is uh, different than sound design, like the sound design that Radio Lab would use or whatever. You know, do you like that more or would you rather just hear, just give me the content without all of this in the way? Oh, well, that's a good question. I I think I've been converted around this. I've been in this field of oral history for 23 years, and I think it was really sacrilegious when I started to corrupt an oral history and make things from it. And now there's like an imperative to put a very accessible version of a long-form interview into the world and to do something like Radiolab, where it's like also thinking about pleasure and entertainment, I think has an important place. Um, in the world and in the audio landscape. But I will say with the caveat is what kind of transparency is there around what has been done and hasn't been done to those interviews? And also, was there any collaboration? What was the process? Mm -hmm. To me, it has a place if there's an archive or if you do something like On Being where you can listen to the full interview as well. Would people, uh, the general public, have access to that? Yeah. um, Well, my school has an archive. It's called the Community Library of Voice and Sound. Um, And this is um, a community-based archive that serves as training for my students who are interviewing longtime residents of Hudson, New York. And it also serves as reciprocity to our community that supports the school And so we do a lot of kind of reflexive practices where we interview people, then we listen to the interviews, we talk about them, we talk about what went well and what didn't. Um, But there are so many beautiful archives. So the archive I first worked in, um, I was hired as an interviewer for Columbia University's Oral History Archive. It's the um, oldest oral history archive in the world, founded in 1948. And for radio producers, I really encourage you to go into these oral history archives, um, there have been some beautiful pieces by David Isay where there's an archival piece and then the person's re-interviewed 40 years later. And I just love it's such an elegant, simple structure. Um, and it that's like a very oral history-ish um, approach. Are you excited about the, I don't want to call it a new wave of citizen journalism, but people have tools and technology now to be able to make content in a way that they didn't before. And in a certain sense, uh, anybody could be a journalist. Does that uh, worry you or are you uh, excited about those types of things? I'd like to be both. I'm excited um, and concerned. I think like a lot of things, we we confuse accessibility with... there's. Yeah, it's accessible. Anyone can do it. But I I hope people take on a particular orientation around ethics. So I like to say with oral history, anyone can do it. It's not that you need any particular training or my training, but you need something. So like, where do we get that something from? And ideally, it's kind of absorbed in the culture that we start to think about some of these like basic ethical 
um, principles, like an interviewee reviewing their interview or collaborating or getting to talk about the things they want to talk about. Um, yeah, yeah, I am concerned about sloppy journalism, but I am excited about participation. So have you had to have uh, to overcome tech hurdles in doing this? I know you said for the most part, you're not getting in there and doing editing. And if so, uh, mm. do you have any suggestions for people who are maybe, uh, this is all a little bit daunting, um, uh, and who are maybe scared about technology? Yeah, I wish I could be everyone's coach. I love carrying people over that threshold, whether it's learning to use an audio recorder or editing. And I am here. My relationship with Hindenburg is because we've really adopted Hindenburg as our editing platform. Um, and uh, Jonathan told me, I have no pressure here to say this, but um, we do that because I, I can confidently tell people in a classroom some of you might love this and some of you might just tolerate it to do what you to make what you want to make but i can get everyone over the threshold here and i do think it's really exciting right now that at a very low cost you can get broadcast quality audio um it's just my favorite thing to see people and we we have people you know 70 and 80 years old who are scared of small digital recorders and i yeah. love how transformed they are when they see that within an hour they can use this recorder. Um, yeah. And personally, I will say that I have always wished to be more of an audio geek, like, and have more time to really, you know, review every new microphone that comes out. And I don't have time, but I will say that on a recent project, I had sound engineers working with me and I liked running my own sound better. So yeah. don't worry if your kit's modest um, and if your own kind of literacy is minimal, you might be doing a good job because you care. Um, and I found my sound engineers really didn't understand what I was doing. And um, so it's like made me feel better about running my own sound for the rest of time. What are your thoughts on uh, the impact of AI tools? <laughs> Uh, on uh, oral history in particular, and uh, what do you think um, is the future of oral history moving forward, bearing that in mind? Well, I guess, I mean, I'm shooting from the hip here because I've been resistant to like getting into this and I need to. Um, so thank you for this invitation. But I would say <laughs> I'm not worried about this oral history, like this collective oral history that we're making, because that's the whole point. We yeah. want people to learn from this. We're, we might be a counter narrative to the dominant record, people telling the truth that's not in the history book. So that like wonderful if that spreads through all, if that's like picked up by, um, you know, different kinds of searches. But, and, and when I, I think there's a real like possibility and potential, when I think about, I have a lot of students with learning disabilities and I can see AI like the fact that we could be training um, non-humans to sound and act like humans. I can see benefits to that in terms of, you know, people who are alone all day and have Alzheimer's and need to hear a human voice instead of a robotic alert to take their medicine, for example. Like maybe we're like creating... Um, you know, emulating humanity. But again, when I think about this sort of imposter possibility, the more sinister possibilities, we don't want to contribute to misuse of people's really important stories. And I do worry about people, I, I do worry about non-humans pretending to be human, you know, like robocalls becoming really believable. But I I'm excited about the idea of um, humane applications and if we're contributing to that, great. Can you uh, tell us a little bit how, where people can find out about uh, the school and sign up and all of that? Yeah, I'd love to tell you about the school and also a sound commission for any sound artists out there, transmission artists, radio geeks. Um, so oralhistorysummerschool.com is our website. We run workshops online and in person. 
Um, also, we have gift cards if you're looking to give your audio file friends um, some gift that allows them to come to a workshop. And we also are um, launching a commission for sound artists to work from our archive. It's a thousand dollars to um, have a like couple hours of orientation about oral history values, and then you'd have access to the audio archive, and then you'd also have five hours with our archivist to help you pull audio and see what kinds of permissions are attached to those interviews, and then make something and. Um, we, that could be transmission art. It could be put on the radio with WGXC. Um, this is a collaboration with Wave Farm, W-A-V-E. Um, and I hope that some of you will apply and make use of our archive and make something, um, that you like to make from sound. Okay. So there you go. Uh, you've heard it here, uh, go to oralhistorysummerschool.com. I got that right, right? Yeah. Uh, and we just want to say thank you again so much. And uh, we hope to see you at the next one. Bye, thank everybody. Thank you so much.